Captain's Courageous by Rudyard Kipling, narrated by George Guidel. I don't know, and I don't care," said Harvey. "I'm grateful enough for being saved and all that, of course, but I want you to understand that the sooner you take me back to New York, the better it'll pay you." Meaning, how? Troop raised one shaggy eyebrow over a suspiciously mild blue eye. Dollars and cents," said Harvey, delighted to think that he was making an impression. "Cold dollars and cents." He thrust a hand into a pocket, and threw out his stomach a little, which was his way of being grand. "You've done the best day's work you ever did in your life when you pulled me in. I'm all the son Harvey Chain has." "He's been favored," said Disco, dryly. And if you don't know who Harvey Chain is, you don't know much. That's all. Now turn her around and let's hurry. Harvey had a notion that the greater part of America was filled with people discussing and envying his father's dollars. Maybe I do, and maybe I don't. Take a reef in your stomach, young fella. It's full of my vittles. Harvey heard a chuckle from Dan, who was pretending to be busy by the stump foremast, and blood rushed to his face. "We'll pay for that too," he said. "When do you suppose we shall get to New York?" "I don't use New York any, nor Boston. We may see Eastern Point about September, and your pa—I'm real sorry I ain't heard tell of him—may give me ten dollars after all your talk. Then, of course, he mayn't. Ten dollars? I see here, I." Harvey dived into his pocket for the wad of bills. All he brought up was a soggy packet of cigarettes. Not lawful currency, and bad for the lungs. Heave 'em overboard, young feller, and try again. It's been stolen," cried Harvey hotly. "You'll have to wait till you see your pa to reward me, then." A hundred and thirty-four dollars, all stolen. Said Harvey, hunting wildly through his pockets. Give them back. A curious change flitted across old Troop's hard face. What might you have been doing at your time of life with one hundred and thirty-four dollars, young fellow? It was part of my pocket money for a month. This Harvey thought would be a knock-down blow, and it was indirectly. Oh. One hundred and thirty-four dollars is only part of his pocket money, for one month only. You don't remember hitting anything when you fell over, do you? Crack again a stanchion, let's say. Old man Haskin of the East Wind, troops seemed to be talking to himself. He tripped on a hatch and butted the mainmast with his head hardish. About three weeks afterwards, old man Haskin he would have it that the East Wind was a commerce destroying man of war, and so he declared war on Sable Island because it was British. And the shoals run out too far. They sewed him up in a bed bag, his head and feet appearing for the rest of the trip. And now he's to home in Essex, playing with little rag dolls. Harvey choked with rage, but Troop went on consolingly. We're sorry for you. We're very sorry for you, and so young. We won't say no more about the money, I guess. Of course you won't. You stole it. Suit yourself. We stole it. If it's any comfort to you. Now, about going back. Allowing we could do it, which we can't. You ain't in no fit state to go back to your home, and we've just come on to the banks working for our bread. We don't see the half of a hundred dollars a month, let alone pocket money, and with good luck we'll be ashore again somewheres about the first weeks of September. But it's May now, and I can't stay here doing nothing just because you want to fish. I can't, I tell you. Right and jest, jest and right. No one asks you to do nothing. There's a heap as you can do. For Otto, he went overboard on La Have. I mistrust he lost his grip in a gale we found there. Anyways, he never come back to deny it. You've turned up, plain, plumb providential for all concerned. I mistrust, though there's rather few things you can do, ain't that so? I can make it lively for you and your crowd when we get ashore. 
said Harvey, with a vicious nod, murmuring vague threats about piracy, at which Troop almost, not quite, smiled. Except talk. I'd forgot that. You ain't asked to talk more than you've a mind to aboard the weir here. Keep your eyes open and help Dan to do as he's bid, and such like, and I'll give you, you ain't worth it, but I'll give ten and a half a month, say thirty-five at the end of the trip. A little work will ease up your head, and you can tell us all about your dad and your ma and your money afterwards. She's on the steamer, said Harvey, his eyes filling with tears. Take me to New York at once. Poor woman. Poor woman. When she has your back, she'll forget it all, though. There's eight of us on the weir here. And if we want back now, it's more than a thousand mile, we'd lose the season. The men, they wouldn't have it, allowing I was agreeable. But my father would make it all right. He'd try, I don't doubt he'd try, said Troop. But a whole season's catch is eight men's bread. And you'll be better in your health when you see him in the fall. Go forward and help Dan. It's ten and a half a month, as I said, and of course all fund, same as the rest of us. Do you mean I'm to clean pots and pans and things? said Harvey. And other things. You've no call to shout, young fellow. I won't. My father will give you enough to buy this dirty little fish kettle. Harvey stamped on the deck. Ten times over, if you take me to New York safe, and, and you're in a hundred and thirty by me anyhow. How? said Troop, the iron face darkening. How? You know how well enough. On top of all that, you want me to do menial work. Harvey was very proud of that adjective. Till the fall. I tell you, I will not. You hear? Troop regarded the top of the mainmast with deep interest for a while, as Harvey harangued fiercely all around him. Shh, he said at last. I'm figuring out my responsibilities in my own mind. It's a matter of judgment. Dan stole up and plucked Harvey by the elbow. Don't go to tampering with Dad any more, he pleaded. You've called him a thief two or three times over, and he don't take that from any living being. I won't, Harvey almost shrieked, disregarding the advice, and still Troop meditated. Of Captains Courageous by Rudyard Kipling Narrated by George Guidel.